So now we're going to jump right into this conversation about black speculative fiction, the presence of Africa in black speculative fiction. The panels today earlier have talked about it in film and popular culture, but it all starts with the book. It all starts on the page. So we're going back to the root, to the source. And I'm going to throw these questions out to our panelists, and we're going to work from the far end and come on down. So Anita Kopach, I'm going to ask you, what has been the evolution in black speculative fiction and or speculative fiction as a whole for the past decade at least. Thank you so much for saying my name right. You're so welcome. <laughs> um, so I feel like the evolution has been that a, a lot of the things that perhaps we were looking for when we were younger, even 10 years ago, um, didn't necessarily exist in the bookstores. Um, I know during uh, my college years, I was able to have your books, luckily, you know, but it was hard to find um, pretty much anything else other than uh, Octavia Butler. And so I feel like where we're moving now there are, and we have other ways of finding these stories, right? It doesn't have to be through the publishers. It doesn't have to be through the different ways that, um, uh, the only ways that we could find them before. And so I feel like there's just a broader, a broader way of us seeing and taking in these stories. Thank you. Yeah. Broader way. What comes to mind, the top three works that you would want folks to read if they're not reading? That Shall after. Shallow Waters. <laughs> <laughs> Who wrote that? <laughs> um, well, for me, it's so interesting because um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not really supposed to say that I wrote it as a YA, mm. but I did. And um, why so, not? Why can't you say it's for young? I audiences? don't know. Simon and Schuster said that I shouldn't say it. <laughs> They're not here. We won't tell. <laughs> so right. um, I'm definitely into. Um, YA, so I'm sure you've read Children of Blood and Bone. And um, yeah, I mean, I would say, and, and all, all of Octavia Butler's mm. to me are just, uh, t Wild Seed, I think, was to me the, the strongest influence um, just to see. Um, a main character, black woman who was full of magic. And, but then when you're reading it, it feels like you're in it with them and it doesn't feel like it's just a magical story. It felt so real. And um, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna toss it over to, to Clarence, the voice Haynes. <laughs> so Clarence, what facets of the continent would, be, would you like to read more of in black speculative fiction? What new, deeper facets are you planning to explore in your work? So this, that's a two-parter. Okay. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. My name's Clarence Haynes, as you've learned. Um, I'm not in the um, program booklet. I was asked to join right. a bit later, so I'm going to give a brief introduction of who I am. Uh, I'm uh, no, I'm going to read your bio. I'm sorry. No, you don't, need, you, don't okay, need to, go ahead, go ahead. you don't need to do that. Um, I'm the co-author of Omar Epps' uh, new young adult Afrofuturist novel called Nubia, The Awakening, which just came out in November. I've also authored a short <laughs> uh, nonfiction work for high schoolers and middle graders called The Legacy of Jim Crow, looking at the legacy of Jim Crow laws in the United States. And I've also worked uh, for many years as an editor in various capacities for Penguin Random House, Amazon, and Hachette Book Group. So that's who I am. Um, <laughs> Thank you Thank for you. having me. <laughs> like, just in case you uh, thought we were just letting Cousin Clarence hang out. <laughs> no um, and to your, um, to your question, Mo, mm -hmm. what I'd love to see um, uh, represented on the page in terms of the continent are um, non-traditional stories. I think that we're getting to a point where um, representing narratives from the diaspora, we're seeing this as important, essential. We're seeing... Um, different audiences come to these stories, not just us, but I'd like to see um, us challenge 
gender norms. I'd like for us to approach things from an intersectional perspective. I'd like for um, the queer community to be super represented in these stories. I'd like for women to be front and center in these stories. Um, so that's that for me is what I'm looking at, what I'm looking for, what I hope to be able to put out there. Um, um, Nubia book two is coming out um, in the fall, but I'm also doing preliminary work on a project that involves a young woman who is of Haitian and Japanese descent. And oh, so, um, you know, that doesn't, you know, it's not uh, a direct relationship to the continent, but it is related to the diaspora and it is something that I, I think is out of the box. And so that's what I, I, I hope to see. Um, I think the um, Africa has a lot of stories. Um, we're, we just, we're just at the beginning. And I think it's a really exciting um, time in terms of what's happening and the explosion of narratives that we're seeing. But I really encourage folks to continue pushing, to continue to, to explore what, what stories we haven't put out there yet and take it from there, so. Thank you. And you did remind me that we need to shout out the folks who couldn't make it today that were scheduled to be on this panel. Way too more couldn't be here. Um, she sends her regards and apologies. And Deidre Holman, who was supposed to be the, uh, the moderator. Um, we may look a little bit of light, but my hair is longer. <laughs> and um, they, they're ill, so we send them our best regards. And please send up some prayers for them that they get better sooner. Thank you. Now, to not a Reeve, do. <laughs> I, I think we know the answer to these questions. So many of us are fans of yours. But what works have inspired and or incited you to weave Afri African themes in your work, and why? OK. Oh, is this on? Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yeah, closer. All right, just bring it closer. All right, sorry about that. I don't want to mess up the tech, because I can't <laughs> fix it. So don't mess up what you can't fix. I want to honor two jewels in the house, uh, Jewel Parker Rose and Jewel Gomez. Uh, yeah. Jewel Gomez in particular because I first met her in 1997 at my very first black speculative fiction, and maybe the very first black speculative fiction conference at Clark Atlanta University in 1997. Oh, wow. Also met Octavia Butler there, married Stephen Barnes. So it was a good, good, <laughs> I have high hopes for this one because that was uh, such a powerhouse. So I, um, wow, complicated question. I, I studied African literature for, for the first time as a graduate student at the University of Leeds in England back in the 1980s, late 1980s. <laughs> I, I did not know anything about African literature, which was shocking to me because in the American school system and canon, I had taken all of the requirements as if I were an English major in college when I was a journalism major, and we studied Comer and, you know, all up and down the gamut, but I can't remember one piece of African literature I was mm -hmm. ever exposed to until I went to England. Now, the reason they study African literature in England is also complicated, but the point is they're mm -hmm. studying it. <laughs> and so I, I came in contact uh, with works by Nigerian authors like Chino Achebe and Wale Shreinka, and that was a big turning point for me in terms of understanding how narrow my understanding of the world was, how rich the African literary tradition was. And I, you know, when I started to write My Soul to Keep as a young reporter for the Miami Herald back in the 90s, I really was drawn toward this notion that I wanted an African character in my story and that Ethiopia had such a rich history that you could believe that immortals would have sprung from Ethiopia. Uh, but side note, I don't know that I would do it today. It's interesting because now that I know so many African writers in speculative fiction, I really might feel that that was a, a character for an Ethiopian writer to, to tackle. You know, it's interesting. I don't know that I would have gone in that direction today. But um, my hope for the future is that more African writers will be better known in speculative fiction. And I will leave it at that. Whoa, that was a powerful statement. So you're saying you're the, you're, you don't want to be a colonizer of sorts? Or right, a appropriating, appropriating, you know. I did a lot of research, mm -hmm. but it, I, I'm, I don't know for sure that I wouldn't, but I don't think I would read, as readily think of it as I did back then when I did not know any African horror writers. Ah. <laughs> uh. And keep throwing out these names, and I hope you all are taking notes of writers you hear that you don't know about so that folks can keep digging into 
the canon. And you brought up a point that reminds me of Chancellor Williams' book, The Destruction of Black Civilization. And so in that book, I'm a Howard University grad. That was one of those books you read. House, House of Knowledge was a couple of blocks away from campus, and that was the most popular book. And I remember in the introduction, Williams being surprised when he started to matriculate at Oxford that African studies was not about in celebrating the continent, but about how to exploit it. Mm. And that's what African studies meant way back when. Mm. So if we were, so I'm really going, let's, let's be speculative. <laughs> so let's speculate. If you were now starting the university of African black speculative fiction, what would be the courses you would have, a, have your professors teach and would you love to teach? Go ahead. I feel like I have a course, in my, not, not in me, but for someone to teach. But um, just how do the sons and daughters of the diaspora reconnect with their spirituality? Mm. Which spiritualities? Let's exactly. Well, <laughs> which one? Because we come from so many different ones. And, you know, when I, when I wrote my book, Shallow Waters, I wrote, it's about Yemeya, Yemoja, and I am, you know, I'm not Ifa. I'm, as far as I knew, I didn't, didn't know I was Yoruba. But as, you know, I felt so strong, like such a strong connection. And I was like, why do I feel this connection? The story was coming through. And while I was doing the tour, the, um, uh, what is it, the African... Uh, the 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 people who do the the DNA test the African African ancestry yes African ancestry contacted me and they did my DNA and I am in fact Yoruba but because I'm a son a daughter of the diaspora I did not know that I didn't know where my people came from and does that mean I'm not connected anymore no because my DNA is totally connected. My spirit is totally connected. When I close my eyes, when I go into the quietness, I'm so connected. And so I think it's just giving us the space to reconnect to, to where our people are from and remember who we really are. Mm. I feel like that would be an awesome course. Right. What's the title again? <laughs> What's the title? Like, what was the title? Yeah. Oh, son, <laughs> Sons and Daughters of the Diaspora Remembering Their Spirituality. Nice. Or remember remembering where we're really from. Thank you. I'm glad we're recording And this. having different ways of remembering, right? Because, yes, there is research, but we carry so much in ourselves and in our ancestral memory and even in our ancestral traumas, so. Mm. Um, I, I can't think of uh, the name for the potential course right now. My brain doesn't work quickly enough, but what I, I think would be a great course uh, or would be ways that, in which we can look at um, contemporary manifestations of speculative fiction whether books, comic books, film, TV, and let's look at um, what are the, the roots of these stories. Mm. Let's look at where they've come from. So for instance, um, with Omar's conception of Nubia, he wanted to present an island that was a metaphor for Africans in their most exalted state. Nubia in the book is located off the west coast of Africa. Nubia in ancient times is, was part of the northeastern region yeah. of Africa. And it's known as being one of the first places where what we would call nation state came into being. And so for us to be able to make those connections and be like, ah, OK, so we're seeing how this person is playing with this real world history that we're not going to get um, in terms of school, mainstream media, that sort of thing. So I'd be really invested in that. And I think you can see that in lots of different narratives out there, that there's usually some sort of um, real world uh, 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 place aspect of history that can be looked to um, that, that, that people were able to draw their creativity from. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and it's also a way of engaging young people with something with history in yes. a way that feels fun and that feels like, ah, this is OK. I can sit, I can vibe with this as opposed to saying, mm -hmm. let's sit here and now learn what happened in ancient uh, Kush. <laughs> and they'd be like, okay, I don't want to hear this. But, um, but if you can take something that feels exciting, engaging, now contemporary, and then sort of take them back, I think that's 
that's really worthwhile. Yes. All right. I love that. Thank you, Dr. Haynes. <laughs> Dr. Dew? I, I love the doctor. I wish I had a real PhD, <laughs> but I will, I will accept that. Um, <laughs> that's right. So I'm just so full of so many things when I think about how much history we have lost. And I think just as I was yearning for more to my story as a young person, say when Roots come out and I got so excited by Alex Haley's journey, it's because not only is our celebrated history often erased here, but our history is, is erased all the way to our ancestors as if we never did anything except serve as cargo. Mm -hmm. And it's insidious. Uh, it really is. So I think my course will be very similar to the course I teach at UCLA, but more so. Uh, because it would be bridging the middle passage. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, I have nothing but respect for African futurism, as it's called. And, and Nnedi Okorafor, the Nigerian-American writer, will you know, very much defend that as its own set of, act, of speculative fiction, obviously. And as an African-American, I can research, but that does not make me an Ethiopian. That does not make me, I might have uh, heritage in Ghana, but I am not Ghanaian, right? So, so I understand that. But I teach African Afrofuturism really as the black speculative arts of the diaspora. That means all of us. So in my current course, yes, I teach a short story by Nettie and, she, and, and work in film and literature by, uh, uh, I have to remember that, uh, Wanuri Kahiyu, some of you may know as a filmmaker, more so than a writer. And of course, uh, Tomi Adeyemi's uh, Children of Blood and Bone. And just watching all these new writers, it's all very exciting. But also, I, I just think it, it behooves us as African Americans to realize the power we have because mm -hmm. Afrofuturism is such a huge international topic. And while African futurism can be separate, when possible, I think it should be blended mm -hmm. in a respectful way because we can all uplift each other. Like I tweeted out this event today and heard from a writer named Anuzo Ono who calls herself the queen of African horror. Oh, if only I could have been there, right? Mm -hmm. And when I was working on a Marvel project based in the world of Black Panther, they realized there were no African writers on this little staff of four or five writers. So they brought in a South African writer who got a great opportunity. Her name is Mohale Mashigo, right? So I think we should all advocate. We should advocate when we have opportunities as African Americans, because we have that Hollywood connection, bring African writers to the table. They are there. They used to say we weren't there. Oh, there are no black horror writers, no black. Yeah, we are here and they are here. So we just have to find each other. Right on. Thank you. Yes. yes. Give it up. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm listening to you all and I'm thinking about the same Kofa opportunity here mm -hmm. to reach back and move forward. When I grew up as a kid, my grandmother had an encyclopedia collection on the, on the shelf that she would have me use for homework projects that some door-to-door -door salesman sold. And I had to do a project on Egypt. And that encyclopedia told me that the Egyptians were Europeans who had migrated back south to Northeast Africa and founded Egypt and built the pyramids. Wow. And I was almost, I was young enough to know this is not true. <laughs> <laughs> like this sounds absurd. <laughs> and my grandma was just like, boy, it's in the book. So it's in the book. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> it must be right, because it's in the book. Oh my goodness. So what do we what sources do would you cite for young writers delving into Africa in their black speculative fiction? that they should lean into mm -hmm. and those that they should run away from? Mm. Well, this is not a black speculative fiction author, but for me, um, I love uh, Maladoma Somme's work. And um, just, I think part of his name was um, to teach the enemy, right? And so, so which is the white man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were waiting for you to clarify. Oh, is it really? Is it? I would have never guessed. <laughs> this is <laughs> so. So a lot of the work that he shares are things that were secrets, right? Mm. Like before they would keep very close to the chest, right? Okay. And so in his book, he shares things that um, they they wanted to keep sacred. And so if we want to know more about certain parts and how we can bring it into our imagination and into our 
our stories, I think it's great to read um, authors that are African that and that that have experienced very, to me, very magical things in real life. Um, okay, as we can bring that, and that's another thing, is that in in. Black speculative fiction. When we when we're thinking of things being magical, I I'm just sitting here and I'm like, well, listen. Every whenever I tell a story, because I'm I'm also I can share it here. I I'm also um, an intuitive healer. I've been doing reading since I was like 18, and so I've I know when things are going to happen, things like that. And whenever I say that to a black person, there's someone in their family that does that or someone who has dreams, who'd be like, oh yeah, we know someone's pregnant because they dreamed about fish. It's very real in our system. And so I feel like there's such an important thing that our books do, it, it awakens that part of ourselves. Mm -hmm. so. That's been sleep, or we didn't even know it's there. Yeah. So I need to, I need to refine my question. So <laughs> not just citing sources, any source, the sources that you use and you've, you vetted and trust, trusted to, to craft your, to craft Africa in your speculative fiction. Mm. Where did you go? And anybody can grab that. I'm trying to grab Google right now, so I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> she like my students. Wait a minute, Mr. Mo, wait a well, minute, you, hold you on. You had said <laughs> Chinua, uh, Chinua My Soul Keep came out in 1997. Yeah. I will find the name before the end of the panel. Uh, and when I think of him, I really want to shout out this mayor. <laughs> <laughs> whose research on Africa in the Middle Ages, and then another, and it might have been another source about the Ethiopian uh, Battle of Adwa in the 1890s, which was what really blew my mind, that Ethiopia actually repelled the Italian army. They were the only African country to repel their colonizers in the 1890s, and I had never heard a word about it. And the more you studied it, the more impossible it sounded because, you know, that was a border that was artificial. There are several ethnic groups that have been clumped together, don't even necessarily get along, had to travel for a year to get to the battle site, taking wow. their wives with them as nurses. And, and this country came together and kicked Italy's ass, pardon my language, <laughs> and kicked them out. And um, in a lot of ways, I wanted to write my soul to keep just so a witness could tell the story. <laughs> you know, yes. just like he could witness American slavery, he could witness that too. So I'm going to find those sources because it's been a minute. <laughs> All right, thank you. Clarence? <laughs> Who do you trust when you go to research? That's a, you know, I tend to um, follow the lead of. African authors. And so um, a colleague who I have worked with on several books now, his name is uh, C.T. I always mispronounce his name. Please forgive me. Uh, Ruizi. Mm -hmm. um, he is uh, based in South Africa. He was born in Zimbabwe um, and raised in uh, what was formerly known as Swaziland. And um, he's written a series of books that are would be considered African fantasy. They don't take place in Africa, but they're heavily influenced by the mythology, the lore, and the politics of the communities he grew up in and that he knows well. And so if they're, so for instance, with Nubia, um, where um, Nubian, the, the fantasy Nubia is influenced by Southern and Western Africa, he would be someone who I would turn to as a source of, okay, is this correct? Is mm -hmm. this right? Does this feel true? Does this feel, does this feel as, as, as you're looking at this, does this feel like something that would, would speak to your heart and what you know to be true in terms of your experiences? And so for me, I say, um, go to people who, who are from, simply from the continent. Um, and um, if we are, do have the privilege of pre presenting stories that are directly connected to the continent, then I think it's our responsibility to have the conversations, to, to be like, wh what's right, what's wrong, what should we make sure that we don't um, uh, mishandle um, or that we wrongfully appropriate, as um, Ms. Stu just so wonderfully said earlier. So 
Thank you. I didn't think of that. The source would be make it personal. <laughs> Take it to the people, not to the book, not to the library. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's, it's easy now. So. Right. True. <laughs> what? Don't, t don't trust Google? Is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> not no, really. <laughs> not, <laughs> Right now. <laughs> it's not helping. No. Google's not helping right now. Ooh, we'll come back. Okay. But I want to, so friends, family, it's 345. So 50 more minutes, we're going to chat with these young folks over here. And we want to open up the conversation to you. So please gather your questions and comments. Um, questions, no soliloquies. Um, <laughs> and oh, I think I found one, although he's American. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, go, go. J.A. Rogers. Okay. <laughs> Y'all knew. Y'all knew. Jamaican American author, but his, his work about Ethiopia was really seminal to me when I was writing on My Soul to Keep. And that's R O G or R O D G? R O G E R S. Thank you, J.A. Rogers. Thank you. So I got a wild question to ask the panel. So in 2043, mm -mm. 20 years from now, what's your most outrageous vision for Africa and black speculative fiction and or black speculative fiction in general? Or speculative fiction in general? Mm. I, I, uh, okay, I'll answer this. I, I just went into my imagination with this because I feel like with speculative fiction, we think of the things that were told to us 20 years ago and how they're reality now, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm just thinking, I mean, even uh, to me, it feels like there might be an even uh, like a new genre of, I mean, just with what the AIs are doing, like some mm -hmm. way of immersing ourselves into literature that I, I don't know. I actually don't know what it looks like, but I feel like some young person will make it happen. Okay, so hold the presses because Tanana Reeve just made a face oh. and you said AI. Yeah. So we all saw it. So you guys. I know. We, well, we don't want them writing I'm stories. I'm just grading essays. <laughs> I'm grading essays and I have, oh, you have some AI suspicions. Essays. I don't know. Mm. I don't have any For proof. For sure. I don't have any proof, but there's just some weird wording and like not everybody, obviously, just a few. So when you say AI, it's scary to me. So, yeah. Um. <laughs> because it will be harder and harder for all instructors, high school, middle school, college, all of us, to tell when essays have been written by students and written by humans. So we can be sharp, but they'll get sharp too. They'll get they sharper. Will. They'll, grow, they'll learn faster they'll than we will. Sharp, yeah. so, so that's scary. That's just, you know. Well, hopefully not the scary part. <laughs> I'm thinking of like the, <laughs> the exciting part. I, I feel like the young people, they have so many things that, they're creating, and there are there are scary parts to it. But you know, our parents were scared of what we're True. living through now, and right. so it's just all a part of the evolution and where we're going. But right. um, yeah, I relax. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's healthy it's, caution it's has its place. You I gotta will, have them writing in front of you. You know, it's so hard to even think ahead twenty years because I'm at the point now where it's hard to think ahead five years. Mm. But we will be in a climate crisis for sure, right. and I think more so than we are. Uh, and and I think that leadership will begin to emerge from artists in a way that has not been normalized yeah. right now. You know, in the past, NASA and different White House think tanks have brought in science fiction writers who are forward thinking and, and who have imagination to help solve crises. And I think that will be more and more normalized. And I do think that because marginalized communities have to keep their eye on the train that's coming at you, yes, in a way that more privileged people don't feel like they have to, a lot of that leadership can emerge. Like with Octavia's work, she was like, I'm about to say, you know you're, watch you're talking out. parables. That's every book she wrote was watch yes. out, right? Yes. And, and that, you know, and when you look at the way, say, black women vote, it's like, oh, they were onto something with the way they didn't like uh, that guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you will start to see more emergent leadership coming out of artists who are more taken more seriously, will have more power, and will be more widely embraced so that hopefully we can help uh, save this world. Literally, literally is how I look at it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in terms of AI, I share your concerns. Mm -hmm. um, 
What I'm wondering is if it will impact the way that we um, construct narratives. As you both know, um, there is a way that we're supposed to tell a story. There are some mm-hmm. certain beats we're supposed to hit. There are certain um, structures we're supposed to adhere to more or less. And I'm wondering if um, AI being able to, I suspect will increasingly be able to do that as well, will then impact our creativity and how we go about um, expressing ourselves in the forms of books, stories on screen, if we're going to be like, okay, so adhering to traditional structure isn't so important now because we have this thing that can do that. What can we bring that's uniquely human, that's uniquely um, ourselves, that's not so um, easily predictable and create stories from that? So that's something that I hope, I'm wondering if could happen, we could see. And then in terms of um, your broader question, Mo, I would love there to be new approaches to identity, how we see ourselves, how we see ourselves as being part of the the diaspora, how we um, approach notions of masculinity, femininity, um, just how we be. I think speculative fiction, particularly black speculative fiction, has always, always, always allowed for us to um, present hidden truths that we otherwise can't so readily express. And so I'm hoping that there's just going to be a flowering of like, you know what, this is who um, I am. This does not remotely um, fit into what my uh, mama, papa, grandmama said I'm supposed to be, but this is who I am. And this is what, this is what my story is um, going to be. So. Ooh. I love that. Clarence. Okay, so this is gonna be my last question. So y'all get ready to get up to this microphone, but I'm gonna drop one. I'm a heavy one. So the, y'all know the actor Alami Ballard? You know the show Numbers? Yes. The black guy in Numbers? Yeah. That's Alami Ballard. He's been in at least one of the Fast and Furious movies. He posted on Instagram about a week and a half ago about his non-binary child mm-hmm. and the trouble that he and his wife were having with it. And he did a deep dive in the history of non-binary human beings and discovered that when colonizers came to this land, the indigenous people had many folks in there. Yeah, heads are nodding, you know. Mm-hmm. Alami and his wife didn't know. And they had people in their communities who were non-binary, sham- and they were often shamans, not always necessarily. But he realized that this he and her and these very strict roles about gender came from the colonizers, and they killed the folks who didn't fit those two modes. Mm-hmm. Killed, the, killed that group off because they were too dangerous. And so Alamin was like, okay, now like that allowed Harry and his wife to relax and realize that their child was really educating them. And again, having a Sankofa moment, reaching back to what it was always already been. So I did that big setup to ask you, are we, are we leaping over the legends and the, the myths and the stories and the traditions that have been, that grew out of the Middle Passage, I hear my, I'm literally hearing my great grandmamas go, well, what about us? And the folks singing work songs and blues and field working and figuring it out. Mm. There are myths and lessons that were transformed in that era. Yeah. Have you done work in that way as well in your work? And what do you say, what do you say to my great grandma mm. who's coming through right now? She's giving me chills. Thank you, great grandma. Um, you know, w- within some of my work, I've I've talked about even just the people can fly, the people who could fly. Um, you know that there are these stories and myths and legends that that have been um, passed down, and I feel like I f- I feel like so many people are honoring them, and there is like that that thin line of you know sometimes people don't necessarily want to read stories that are about that time because it's so painful. And, um, but for me, it's so important to do it in a way that it's a medicine story so that when we come out, we don't wanna necessarily, sometimes we wanna come out like really mad and you know, anger is good too. But a lot of times it's not great for our, 
our uh, nervous system. So we want to have the medicine stories so that we're healing those ancestral wounds. And a part of that is remembering and honoring our ancestors that went through that, that did do, you know, all of the things that you were saying. And um, I also did want to say, um, like the two spirit people within the the um, indigenous, I do have a two spirit character within shallow waters, and um, and I do have um, a woman a woman that's gay in the book because I wanted to bring in and and it's not pointed out it's just a part of the story you know it's just you know it's to me it's very important for inclusion and for everyone to just see that. We're normal people, you know. Mm -hmm. just, part of the family. Yeah, part of the family. Always been here. Yeah. Anybody else want to add into that? Well, I'll just jump in and say that that one of the short stories I teach in my for futurism class at UCLA is by Samuel R. Delaney, who was also at that groundbreaking conference at Clark Atlanta in 1997, and that story is called "I and Gamora," mm -hmm. and that is a story about non-binary people and the people whose kink is that they're attracted to people who, who don't have a, a gender, right, or don't identify with a particular gender. Um, so everything old is new again in some ways. I mean, of course, he was many, many, many years ahead of his time. And in some ways, the culture is only now catching up to Samuel L. Delaney of the 1960s. But at the same time, what's great about Afrofuturism, black speculative fiction, the black speculative arts, however you want to call it, is that there seems to be an understanding that artists have, whether it's sampling in music, which to me is just honoring mm -hmm. what has come before, okay. uh, in the same way in Black Panther, the film, they carry spears and also have hovercraft. So you have the old and the new right. in that Sankofa mm -hmm. space you're talking about. That is such a part of Afrofuturism's DNA. And yes. I think part of it is because we understand so deeply that you can't get where you're going unless you know where you've been. Definitely. Uh, and if you don't know where you are, certainly. So the every time period is of importance to us, even though, yeah, those of us who are raising kids know that they can't wait to forget all about us, everything we think they know, <laughs> or we think we know. But culturally, we are understanding that we can remake ourselves and we can change the myth of who we are while at the same time honoring especially the sacrifices and the struggles that was turned to the beauty of jazz and the beauty of blues and 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 uh, so many contributions we and hip-hop that we have made through struggle and i think that we can do all of those things we can change it and we can honor it and we can move forward and we can also continue to look backward Ooh. Mm. Like yes <laughs> grandma and them say thank you <laughs> yeah. Because they did sacrifice. Hmm. So it is coming up on 4 p.m. And I invite you, please, to come on down to the microphone because we are recording. We want to make sure the world hears your question and joins in this community conversation. Um, make sure that we cover as much ideas and questions that are in our heads in this come. Is it both sides? Yes. Come on down. Hey. Hi. Let's Share your name you if you'd over. like, and then your question. Hi. Okay. So this is basically for the entire um, panel. So there's a couple of disruptions that are happening now in Africa. Like, for example, um, the Chinese takeover of Africa as we know it, as well as the movement of colonizers from one space to the next. Um, and by 2053, by some studies, uh, the black, the American black uh, income would be zero. So if we look at those things and we bring it back to the black speculative, um, you know what I mean, genre, how would uh, those changes impact um, that genre? And also, what should we do as authors to push people moving forward? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So I think, you know, for me, I feel like when we think about our history as um, black people, I mean, all the way back to when some of us came from Africa, there has always been just certain types of struggle and things like that, and that we've gone through 
we've gone through struggles that are so immense and intense and and have created like like we were talking about up here just joy we've created music we've created stories and so i feel like as authors and as creators we just continue to do that and continue to put out our our um medicine in that way and if you feel like those two things are things that 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 you are connected to maybe that's what you're you write about right mm -hmm. so that more people can know what is happening in africa with the chinese right or like more people can know yes you really need to figure out what you're doing for your future generations um to to create funds and money uh, but i just feel like we we do as artists a lot of things that we create show up in life later on so Maybe you're creating this next reality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Like that. Hey, come on now. Yes. Greetings. Greetings. I want to start by public acknowledging my colleague, Dr. Br well, not Dr. Brenda Green, because we're not using those superlatives for one of the best conferences I've been in. And I've only been here 30 years, but one of the best conferences she's put on. <laughs> my question. Uh, we have the speculative literature, but what about the theory? And I'm talking about to what extent the works of Bell Hooks, Kimberly Crenshaw, Del Be Derek Bell, uh, Du Bois, to what, to what extent does that theory influence your work? Because mm. I, when I teach, I have to juxtapose, because they say, you know, Dr. Thompson, this is a lot of painful stuff. So I got to juxtapose it with some theory. Del, you know, you know, uh, Bell, uh, Bell, uh, Derek Bell's work. I, I do. Zornia Hurston, mm -hmm. Kimberly Crenshaw. And then there's also Judith Herman, Trauma and Recovery. So how, to what extent do we need to juxtapose the theory along with the speculative literature? I think I can answer that, thank goodness, because that's a tough question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is a tough crowd in here, a tough crowd. Okay, but in any case, um, again, in my UCLA African Afrofuturism class, what I like to do is let the artists express the theory through their creative work in the same way I'm trying to train my students to either spot the philosophy behind other people's art or to learn how to create their own art and their own philosophies. And I'll give two quick examples. One would be The Space Traders by Derek Bell, which Reggie Hudlin made, it, and I think both Hudlins made into a short film on HBO many years ago that's still available on, on, online. It's on YouTube for free, The Space Traders. And if you're familiar with that story, and it is critical race theory, it is the one thing that is actually critical race theory. <laughs> it's not just something that makes white people uncomfortable. Um, that story is basically what would happen if aliens came to the United States and said they would solve all of our problems, give us all the wealth, if only the United States turned over all of its black people. And we all know how that story would end. And um, I taught it right before Trump was elected and students were like, oh snap, this is that story <laughs> expressed in real life. And the other one is W.E.B. Du Bois who a lot of people do not know, was a bit of a little science fiction writer himself. I teach his short story, The Comet, in my black horror class as a precursor to Get Out, because he was writing his horror story about an interracial couple 100 years or so before Jordan Peele did. It's a different story. But again, students kind of are mind blown that this SAS and scholar also wrote fiction and also wrote horror science fiction, and it kind of blows their minds. So hopefully through the art, they are learning about the uh, philosophies. And, and to uh, Professor Dew's uh, point, so I know all of the theory. I was a Afro-Am, African-American studies, psychology, double concentration. I, I know all of the theories that you've spoken of, and I use those theories to inform the commercial work yep. that I um, do. So I, I love Derek Bell's Faces at the Bottom, uh, of the well and use that to think about like, okay, how can we, we um, approach a particular conflict issue item in this work of com commercial fiction that we're supposed to be getting to the masses. So I, I do, oh, I <laughs> like, you know, I'm the product of exactly, Great. you know, that sort of teaching, so. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Hi. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So first I want to say thank you to you all because I didn't even know about Black speculative um, fiction. 
on oh, science really? fiction. <laughs> so I heard about this. I'm like, huh, okay. I love Star Trek, so let's see where we can go. So um, you all speak of um, appropriation. So my question to you is, what is the barometer for detecting if your work is appropriating African writers? Like, is it like a moral compass thing? Is it, I don't know, it, it seems like something that I never heard of before. So I'm curious about that. Mm. Thank you. Great question. It's a great question. That's I, great I question. can um, speak to that a little bit because my, my book is about a Yoruba Orisha um, uh, Yemeya. And so while I was writing it, I did have a lot of those feelings of, am I appropriating? And, you know, I, I spoke to a many, many of my Yoruba friends as far as like making sure that what I'm writing in there is, you know, does this make sense? And, um, to me, it was more of my spirit was so pulling me in that direction. And so it just felt like nothing could stop it. And so I was like, well, let me just do it. And then when I put it out there, you know, then I'll deal with if there's any backlash. And I didn't experience any, not yet. <laughs> but um, it, that, that is a great question because yes, it feels like it, maybe it is a story that a Yoruba woman would write and, and but but it also is brings me back to us being sons and daughters of the diaspora and like still feeling that connection right that um <laughs> your your um question spoke to something i struggled with um deeply around um what right do i have to uh represent elements of the continent, particularly in a um, fictitious, some might argue super heroic context and looking at what's sort of um, out there right now. And for me, it was very similar to what Anita just said. Um, with Nubia, the focus is on um, being part of the diaspora. Um, the focus is on a group of young people who actually in many ways would um, identify as much as New Yorkers, as Nubians. And that speaks to my experience as well as the descendants of people from Panama and Barbados and Jamaica. Um, and so how to, I felt like approaching the story from that perspective allowed me to have access to the story that perhaps otherwise I would not have been fully um, comfortable with. But it's something that weighed on me greatly, deeply, almost every writing session, so. And I think this is uh, a good thing if it weighs on us. You know, that's the path because there's stand your lane and there's also write the other, right? Like some you, someone could point a finger and say, well, how come you've never written this kind of character who's nothing like you. And I think all artists have not just the right, but also the responsibility to exercise their creative muscles in writing characters who are different. However, to the stay in your lane portion, I would, if I were doing my soul to keep today, I definitely would seek out other Ethiopian fantasy and, and horror writers. Now back then I didn't know who any, I wouldn't have been able to name anybody, but if you do a quick Google now, a list just, just Ethiopian fantasy authors, the one I know of, Maza Menjiste, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, is someone I know personally. I would just say, would you mind reading this? What do you think of this? Is there a young author um, I can pay? That's important. I can pay <laughs> to be a consultant on this project. And, and then I think it, it sort of makes it a little better. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Give it up. Well, I wanted to thank you all for the archive of sources they all have been creating with this panel. I find it really helpful and useful. Um, but to build off of that, um, I had a question that I, I teach at Queens College CUNY, um, and I'm teaching an African-American literature course themed on black speculation. Um, and we had a section on African futurism, right? Reading Nnedi Okorafor's Binti. 
And I got a little bit of pushback from some of the students, right, about like why include this in an African-American lit course, right? Um, and so I just wondered if y'all had any thoughts about, you know, sources that showed the importance of both, right, of sort of both sides of the diaspora and other ways of thinking about the diaspora. Um, you know, my answer to to that in the moment was just sort of to to read the intro to City of Hartman's Lose Your Mother, right, to sort of talk about what it means as a Black American, right, to think about our relationship to diaspora. Um, but I was really interested in hearing y'all's y'all's input on that. And was the pushback? Well, I'm sorry. Was the pushback specifically around the fact why was there an African? Author in the, or was it because it was speculative um, fiction? A little bit of both, but mostly, mostly the fact that it was an African author. Yeah, I have a suggestion uh, for an anthology that was actually co-authored by Cherie Renee Thomas, who's being honored later today, called Africa Risen, A New Era of Speculative Fiction, which is intentionally a combination of, I think, majority African, but some African-American speculative writers, just sort of that bridge that I'm talking about, because I just don't personally see the value of, of that degree of separation mm -hmm. where you can't, like I can't see myself in, mm -hmm. in a young African person or a young African person can't see themselves in me. I mean, granted there are differences and there are stereotypes. It's not like we all hold hands and get along, mm -hmm. but whether it was colonialism or slavery or whatever, there are so many struggles that we have in common, so much lineage and things that we practice as African-Americans that are coming from our West African lineage that we don't know came from our West African lineage. So I think a book like that might help create a bridge for your students. And if I may add, that book is available at sistersci-fi.com. It's a, 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 a independent platform uh, run by a black woman who has a range of black speculative fiction titles from uh, authors uh, from the continent, African-American authors. It, it's wonderful. That's you know she did. Um, uh, she had a discussion with the uh, authors recently on IG Live. It was it was really great. Great. Thank thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. SistaSciFi.com, like S I S T A H, I believe. S C I F I. Thank you. Right. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Iman, and thank you everyone for today in the panel. So it's, um, my question kind of is like intertwined with what was just spoken about. So I'll just go ahead and say it anyway, but it's like, how can we utilize this, this platform, this vehicle to, pro to promote, um, you know, pan-Africanism and that unity and that understanding of um, that we are all one, that's what we all have in common in the diaspora and that, that's what bridges us together because we all face the common oppression because we live in an anti-black world. Yes. Mm. Um, I can't remember if it was said on this panel or the one before. I think maybe you have said it. But any time that we're in a space where we can bring in other people to um, uplift, like bringing in our African brothers and sisters and like allowing their voices to be heard in certain spaces where we are, I feel like including like as much as we can do it in our uh, personal lives, you know, like we said, we have, we have social media, sharing them on social media. Um, I feel like, like that is a way that we can do it personally ourselves because we have so much power that we sometimes don't even realize we have. And just doing it ourselves, like doing it personally, holding hands, <laughs> <laughs> no, we said we're not always holding hands, but we can be. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, um, I've been thinking, I'm still reflecting on all the things you said. I wanted to ask a question about genre and naming. I love the expression black speculative fiction. I was really annoyed by Afrofuturism because it's like we're letting this white man name our <laughs> discipline. But I don't understand why we gave up science fiction mm -hmm. so often. And part of, and the reason I say that is I spent a lot of money on science fiction and fantasy books over my, the course of my life. We have contributed as consumers to the success of the science fiction and fantasy genres. And then when, it, when we're blossoming, we're kind of 
not recouping our investment in the development of that genre, and specifically, what are the values of linking embracing Africa to embracing science fiction as our genre, embracing science as ours? And I'm, I'm asking this as an educator where there's such a great opportunity for science fiction to bring young people into the STEM disciplines. And just at that very moment, when we have the greatest opportunity, I feel like we've turned our, our backs a little bit on the very thing that we put so much work, unacknowledged work and money, um, uh, into creating. And so I wonder what you think about how we reclaim it, um, or refuse to let it go maybe, and how we refuse to let also the idea of fantasy go, like white people get to have fantasy and we don't. Like how do we negotiate, how do we carve out our own space without giving up territory that we create, like we harvested that territory and now we're giving it up? So I wanted to find out your thoughts on that. Who wasn't? Well, um, I. I think everything you you've said is right on is is correct, and I don't necessarily know if from my perspective that we have to give up anything. I I I my uh, approach is that um, black speculative fiction can be a, a really useful umbrella term, um, and that we can use it as necessary. But I'm still a science fiction person. I'm still a fantasy person. I I have no problem using the word. Um, Afrofuturist or African futurism or whatever it is that speaks to um, what my relationship to a particular narrative is, and I I don't think that we have to make that choice. I don't believe I absolutely do not believe in that. Also, as someone who edits um, white authors, um, authors of of different ethnic backgrounds, so I I think it's we should have it all quite frankly, um, and we don't have to give up anything. And I, I think your um, um, statement around science fiction being uh, such a wonderful uh, uh, conduit for young people to come to STEM, absolutely, um, absolutely. Thank you. Mic drop. <clears throat> good, good evening, good afternoon, the panel. First of all, I wanna say I'm honored to be here by virtue of the power of the pen, power of the pen by Dr. Wright Dr. Kathy Wright. Um, so my question revolves around as the evolution of black speculative fiction increases and becomes more and more, uh, more and more popular in the genre of education per se, how does that, how, how, what are your feelings about STEM and the proliferation of STEM, you know, science and, and so forth? And how does that work in the general educational realm in terms of black fictional speculative writing? How does that work for students, for younger students? How, how would that get to younger students in the elementary, uh, let's say, um, grades, so forth and so on? That's primarily a horror writer. I'm far from an expert on this. But uh, when I hear both of you use the term STEM with sort of that yearning to create a bridge for students from the sciences into the arts, I'm thinking of the version of it that is called STEAM. Now I forget what all the other letters stand for, but A stands for arts. <laughs> right? That's the one that caught my attention. Um, and young people are so imaginative that storytelling and imagination are, are always a way to catch their interest. If you can create um, sort of a relationship between a story they make up and a, a, a technology that's either real or imagined, that's the first step toward them seeing themselves in the sciences uh, and having gained that knowledge in the sciences to be like science fiction writers. Like a lot of people forget that in science fiction, it's not just futurism, it's that there is an element of biology or chemistry or social science fiction, which Octavia also did, but she also did biological uh, science fiction, mm -hmm. like where you have to study and talk to some experts. Absolutely. That's not the kind of writing I prefer to do. <laughs> so that's why I'm not primarily known as a science fiction writer. But part of it is for students to even understand 
that that is part of what you use that knowledge for. When they say, what will I ever do with this? Which my son always said to me, it's like, well, you might write a great novel one day. That's what you might do with this. So that's why you should study your biology. Who knows? Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Is there someone coming down? Well, that brings me to, uh, I actually want to add a question. We've got about 10 minutes left, or well, five minutes, and then I would ask you all to close out with some lasting words. You actually make me think of Thad Munford. When I was at Howard, uh, he, was a tour he was a tour manager in the music business. And he was the tour manager for Marvin Gaye until he died. And at Howard in the theater department, he was, they were managing Stephanie Mills on the road, and they came to talk to students. And hip hop was about to, t that's when hip hop was just about to take over as the hottest music on the planet over rock and roll. And the students were giving them leading questions to say, so you've been in the music business for X amount of years, and what's the hottest music around the world? Like, everybody loves. And Thad paused, and he said, you know, I've toured all over the planet. When I go to Japan in a record store, I look for music alphabetically. When I go to Amsterdam, the same thing. When I go to Spain, the same thing. He said, it's only until I get to the United States of America that I walk into a record store or a bookstore and it's categorized, country western, mm -hmm. rock, mm -hmm. folk. He said, only in the United States do you have, is it broken down like that? He said, the rest of the world just loves music. Wow. 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 All right, so. Mike, drop that mic. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, is it too much ado about too much? when we try to define sci-fi over speculative, over fantasy? I hate labels myself, you know? <laughs> um, it, as a new writer, it was one of the most frustrating things, not knowing, where, where, is my book over here in the horror section? Is it in the African-American section? Wouldn't it be easier if I could just look under D, as you're saying? <laughs> And I, I grudgingly came to accept that, that publishers and bookstores consider there are strong reasons for this so that customers can quickly find what they're looking for. But I do struggle. You know, a lot of people identify Afrofuturism differently than I do, you know, as African American and not including uh, other writers, you know, and, and that is not acceptable to me. So I prefer black speculative arts anyway, because black is black to me. And uh, I don't know, it's kind of a love-hate relationship I have with labels. And I would love to see them disappear, but I think that will only happen once it's not a big deal anymore, when it's not, there's no conversation. Of course there's black science fiction, of course there's black fantasy, because that's just what everybody's reading. <laughs> <laughs> right. So thank you for that one. Um, and I guess, again, the marketplace says, it's easier for you to sell your books and they become bestsellers if people know what section in the bookstore they're in. Yeah. Is that the other side of it? That's what they say. <laughs> That's what they say? <laughs> what do you believe? I feel like a lot of um, artists and uh, authors within uh, black speculative fiction, we've had this experience because, you know, if you look up my book, it is fantasy, it is science fiction, it is historical fiction. There's a lot of different, you know, the right. different labels that have been put on it. So um, I think maybe for me, historical fiction might be one of the, uh, yeah, I, you know, it's hard. It's hard because right. there's just been, so, there's so many that they give us and it's just like, okay, just put them all there. <laughs> Well, then that's a great question. That's what they give us. Yeah. So what would we give us? Mm -hmm. Like, is Afrofuturism, speculative, speculative fiction, our labels? What would we give it? I like to, um, I, for when I describe um, stories that might be, fall under the speculative fiction label, I usually will just say um, stories that are fantastic and that center our experiences. That's sort of... Mm -hmm. And take and do play with it how you will. That's not useful for the publishing industry, mm -hmm. but that I, I do find that it's useful just in terms of for my own um, peace of mind. Um, so I don't go crazy trying to be like, well, you can look at it this way, look at it that way. Um, <laughs> and so 
And so that's really it. Um, I, I don't know, you know, um, for, for, for Professor Dew's work, when she was speaking around as when she was right, starting to write, and just this idea of where does she fall, I understand why, because it's not, her work's not easily categorized you can, it draws from all these different experiences and perspectives. And so, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's, it's useful to be aware of what the labels are, how they're used, why they're used, how to find stuff. But then I do think it's important to develop your own personal relationship to your thing, whether as a writer or a reader, and be like, this is what I think my thing is. This is how I'd call my thing is as a reader. This is what this thing means to me. That's what I, Whoa. That's what I think. Well, well, Dr. Haynes, you bring up a really great point that really you sparked before in my research to be the new moderator for this. So your bio wasn't in the program. So I Googled, Googled Clarence Haynes. And the Clarence Haynes I came up with was a Bible biblical writer. <laughs> And I was like, that's why, that's why I put think, the A. That's why I put the I A. I think this is the Clarence coming. To <laughs> that's why I put Clarence A. <laughs> but so the label helped because, like, I don't think he's a Bible, you know, a, you know, um, authority, authority on biblical literature. Uh, and I love the, I love the term. The did you say fantastical? Uh, fantastic, uh, the fantastic stories, fantastic narratives, stories that um, uh, celebrate the fantastic, that showcase the fantastic. Right, because if I went in the bookstore to find the right Clarence Hain, I'd be like, can I get the Clarence Hain that's in the fantastic, fantastic, <laughs> fantastic section? So there's value to that. But again, that's our, that's our label, the fantastic, the black fantastic. Um, Y'all can hold on to that, the black fantastic. That's right. I like that too. I like that too. Could we give a hand again for this fabulous session? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Brenda, we good? Thank you.